Uh, so Martin <clears throat> is a client library written in C Sharp that allows .NET developers to treat the Postgres QL database as both a document database and an event store. So <clears throat> this all came about for us. Uh, let me get into it. This all came about for us. My shop had a pretty deep investment into RavenDB as a document database. We love the development experience. Um, I'll get into some of the benefits, what we think some of the benefits of having a document database were. Um, but in production, we were having some issues with RavenDB. We felt like we needed to get off of it before the next year rolled around in our busy part of the season. So what we needed to have was some easy migration path off. So my company started Rick started Martin in the fall of October 2015. Uh, we were looking to try to make a near drop-in replacement for RavenDB. Uh, one of my former colleagues had had the idea for years that hey, Postgres is pretty cool. It has all this this JSON support. Um, maybe we could use it as a document database instead. And at the same time, we've done some experimentation years earlier using Postgres as an event store. Uh, we also had some usage of very, very early versions of an event store that we, would, we also wanted to modernize. So we also theorized that while we're in there, the document database ends up being kind of a nice way to be the read side of an event sourcing kind of store um, that we would just use the one Postgres database as both our event store and a document database as we needed to. Uh, we started blogging this. We did it out in the very open from the very beginning. Um, that's turned out to be extremely advantageous for us. When we did this as an open source, when we started blogging about it, speaking about it a little bit, uh, we've gotten a decent level of community, a lot of ideas, a lot of feedback, early users that adopted it really before we put it into production, found a lot of bugs. The old saying that uh, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, we got to see a little bit of the benefit of that. So. This is the, the one case I can think of where this, this worked out very well for us. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> before getting into too much of it, when you're developing software, you have, you're building a lot of different systems. There is not a one size fits all for how you're going to persist state in your system. There are still plenty of cases where old-fashioned relational database that we've used for however many years, for me it's 20 plus years now, that still works perfectly fine. Places where you may have a more hierarchical data set, um, your domain model may have a lot of hierarchy, may have deep structures, I think the document database is easier. There are plenty of business workflow intensive cases where you may want to go to event sourcing. And at the same time, you may still want to use ORMs, whether it's it's EF or Hibernate, or in this case, Dapper actually integrates very well with Martin. By using the Martin and PostgreSQL combination in the same database, with the same deployment, all the same migration scripts, we can do many different kinds of persistence and even let the type of persistence vary by feature within the same system. Not, not saying you absolutely want to go do that, but it's awesome that it's possible. <clears throat> All right, so why, why would you possibly want to use a document database? And what do we get out of it? So what we found, and especially when your domain model is something that's hierarchical, something complicated, um, a trading a system that models, models trades. For us, um, quoting, Quoting systems where quote, quoting documents are multi-level, very complicated. There's different types of quoting. What we see with the document database, because in, in essence, all we're really doing is instead of trying to map all the elements, fields, and properties of this whole object model to 
a bunch of different database tables. We're just serializing it to JSON and stuffing it in one field of the database. So the classic impedance mismatch problem that hurts us so much with trying to base object-oriented systems on top of a relational database, most of that goes away. Come a little farther in, you know, we're into the second decade of agile development. And one of the things that came out of extreme programming was this idea that if we want to do evolutionary design, emergent design, continuous design, whatever you want to call it, to pull this off, we really need this idea called reversibility. Just meaning that we can change your mind on technical decisions at will. In, in the case of a document database, because you are just persisting a JSON blob, we can add properties, remove properties, change quite a bit of the structure of our domain model objects, and still run just fine on our document database. It enables us to make changes and evolve our domain models much faster, which enables us to work in an agile, agile um, manner. And then it, it is just a lot of less mechanical work. You don't have the detailed mappings. You're not having to spend as much time fretting over, should I be lazy here or eager there? Um, pulling a document is pulling one row by its primary key. So it's just less to worry about. The last bullet point here, this is a big point and I think this gets overlooked. If you're saying that I want to have a reasonable degree of test automation coverage for my system, and at least at an integration level, that means it needs to go through the database. A document database, in my experience, has been vastly easier to deal with than a relational database. Setting up data is much easier, especially when you get to bypass a lot of relational integrity. Um, all those foreign keys in your relational database to keep your data clean. But it also adds mechanical overhead when you're trying to set up data for automated tests. Um, you end up setting up a lot of data you don't really care about in the test just to make the database shut up. Same thing, you know, automated testing to be effective, you have to control the state, the known state before you run a test. It's extremely easy with a document database. Um, RavenDB is probably the best tool ever for this kind of thing. Um, we've tried to come as close as we can with Martin, and I'll show how one line of code completely tears down a Martin database and just happily rebuild for a new test. Don't, don't worry, we're about to get into code. So why use PostgreSQL? Or really the question probably is, since this is a .NET project, why didn't we use SQL Server? And this is something I get asked quite a bit, occasionally asked, when can we support Oracle or MySQL as well? But usually, why aren't you on SQL Server? <clears throat> and the main reason, PostgreSQL has some unusual and, and I would say unique uh, support for JSON. There is a type that seems to be specific to PostgreSQL that is a binary, pre-parsed version of JSON called JSONB that gives you a much more efficient mechanism to query through. Um, PostgreSQL allows us to run JavaScript inside of the database engine itself. And there are a handful of features inside of Martin that utilize that, you know, both for document transformations, partial document updates, probably quite a few more things coming up. And beyond that, PostgreSQL, even though it's, it's very old, um, its community is very vibrant. There's a lot of tooling and ecosystem around that. By writing on top of PostgreSQL, um, we instantly had much greater access to management kind of tools, monitoring tools, deployment tools than we had before. So now, finally, we'll, let's jump in and just see what Martin can do. Um, if you happen to already be familiar if you happen to have used RavenDB, this is going to look very natural. If you're coming from something like MongoDB, it's still going to look pretty familiar, I think. 
So from the very simplest, simplest thing, and let me do one quick thing here. Just to, uh, um, if you could see my hands, I'm doing the nothing up my sleeves kind of motion right now. So looking at our database, I'm going to be writing to <clears throat> over here the just the public schema in my development local development database. And right now, there are no tables, no stored procedures. There's just nothing. It's an empty database. All right. Um, the very simplest way to very quickly set up a Martin <clears throat> Martinized database. I'm just going to say document store dot for and pass in a connection string. And this connection source thing is just a helper to look it up for me. Just not much interesting there. Once I have that, now let's say we have a pretty simplistic domain uh, model around orders. So we have an order. In this case, it's going to be identified by a quid, um, an ID property that, that is meaningful here. Uh, and it's going to have some detailed children. So first example, let's just try to create an order object, persist it with Martin, and then load it back up. So here we've created an order. You'll notice that I haven't assigned an ID to it yet. And don't really need to. From my document store, the, think of this as the equivalent to like the, the in Hibernate session factory. Um, oh, you'll have to forgive me. I've been on EF a long time. The DB context factory, I think, in EF. Oh, sorry, I don't remember. So to get at, <clears throat> to access Martin, we're going to create an I document session. <clears throat> and I'm going to do that by going to the store, and I'm just going to say, give me a lightweight session. <clears throat> Let's not worry about what lightweight means here. Uh, so the I document session is Martin's unit of work implementation. So it would be very similar to an in Hibernate session or in any framework DB context. So I just need to tell the session, when you're persistent, I want you to store this order. And then here, I'm going to call save changes. We're going to do this all synchronously just for the second. <clears throat> As I run the test, you'll see Martin behind the scenes assigns the ID because it sees that one's missing. So it just does that for us. And then I'm going to open up a totally new session. This time, I'm going to make a, a read-only session. And I'm going to load it just by its identity and just prove that it really did get saved off. Here, maybe just to <clears throat> just to prove that something happens. Let's look at what the object itself looks like. Just to look at what the object coming back looks like. So I'm going to run this test real quick, and we'll check out the output. Okay, so looking at our output here, uh, we did pass, it did work. <laughs> Martin kind of happily sees that you haven't assigned an ID to that domain model object, so it does it for you right before it saves it. And here you can just see the serialized JSON of the document, the second copy of the document we retrieve from the database later. Now, coming over and looking at our database here on the right side, in a purely development mode, uh, Martin is able to just kind of quietly check into the database and see, does it have everything it needs to have? The first time you access and try to persist the order, it sees that, hey, I don't have any data structures around the order, so I'm just going to make them up on the fly. So now you see a table in here to store the orders. There's not a whole lot to it. There's an ID field a JSON B field that's the raw data that you'd expect, uh, uh, just a little bit of metadata, things, the things that you would expect. When was it last modified? There's a little bit of kind of e-tag support for versioning. 
and it tracks what the .NET type itself was. I also throw a couple of functions in here that you're probably not gonna spend a lot of time looking at. Uh, if you are coming from SQL Server and you're not familiar with Postgres, Postgres does have a really cool, let's see if this opens. Postgres does have a really cool feature for upserts, which you're seeing right here. Um, but I, I think is, so the, the case, the use case of, I want you to update this document if, if it exists, and if the ID doesn't exist, just quickly do a, um, oh, sorry, it goes the other way around. Insert first, and if it already exists, do an update instead. Uh, so this came in, I think, Postgres 9.5. Um, this is a nifty little feature I like in Postgres that I'm, I don't think exists in SQL Server yet. So that's that's the simplest possible usage of Martin. And then because of the world we live in, we need to do the same thing in a purely asynchronous manner. So Martin's adopted the pretty idiomatic .NET approach that uh, we have asynchronous flavors of almost all of our API where we just depend on the async, async uh, suffix. Oh, sorry. So we can load it asynchronously and then we can originally save it asynchronously. Now, I've been claiming all along that with the document database uh, approach, it's very easy to change our, our model objects and, and evolve them without having to absorb so many um, compensating changes to the database. You know, the standard, a former coworker of mine used to, to laugh at Paul, but it's the, the wormhole effect that to add a field to a, to a UI screen, I need to do all these steps. I need to add a column in the database, a property in my object, and all kinds of mappings. And we can bypass a little bit of that here. But to make this be a little more honest, um, So let's say our order now has an address object um, property on it as well. And this is pretty current, so much going on there. And then, so that we're not cheating, we need to, to move to a little more complicated setup. So we still need that. And I'm going to eliminate that. So we're going to do this again, but we're not going to force it to drop and recreate the database. This, <clears throat> this still makes it check that the database right here. Let's do this again. So this is the mode you run in in production. So let me try this again. Austin, it is the U.S., so we're going to pretend everything is the U.S. Let's try this again. <clears throat> and if you squint really hard, we didn't change the database at all. Um, so this setting to... Auto create none means that Martin won't, will not be allowed to make any changes to the underlying database schema, but we were still able to persist an order object with this brand new address property, no problem. Nothing had to change. So this is the kind of thing I mean when I talk about reversibility, just your ability to evolve and absorb changes without incurring a lot of mechanical friction in, in your code. Notes. Okay. Uh, Martin, if there, there are any questions yet, I'm, I'm setting up for the next thing. 
Yeah, there's uh, there's one question here, uh, which is, can we store raw JSON instead of mapping the data to a DTO? Uh, if you're going to do that, well, you can always cheat and go straight to the tables. Um, that's not idiomatic Martin usage, but if, if that's what you want to Okay, so you can always do that yourself if you still want to be able to read it in as a as a Martin use Martin and do TTO later. But that's not idiomatic usage, and at that point, maybe Martin's just getting in your way, and you just go straight to Postgres. All right, thanks. All right, so. Oh, <laughs> I forgot I was doing this. If you're, you're curious where the name comes from, um, Martin, I'm sorry, it's not actually named after you. Uh, I followed you for years, but but sorry. Oh, well. This animal um, is much cuter than I am. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I grew up far enough south that, that I wasn't really familiar with these until we started the, the project. But Martin is named after a weasel-like animal that lives uh, – lives in the northern U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, look how cute these things are. If you're wondering what the name is. But, so where we're going next. Um, last year, I was doing a lot of interviewing. We were expanding our architecture team and trying to hire quite a few senior developers. And I would pretty frequently ask them, um, really kind of getting the feel for, have you ever worked with you NoSQL know, approaches? What do you think about it? How does it impact the, your development process? And I really just kind of wanted to hear what they thought about things like the reversibility, the testability, the things that I thought were important. But every single one of them first brought up the, the fact that, or the idea that having a NoSQL database means that you aren't asset compliant and you need to worry about the model of eventual consistency and talking about all those workarounds, um, which can be kind of painful. Um, our, our experience with eventual consistency in a document database was pretty harmful. There was just a lot of times when it wasn't acceptable for us in, in terms of what you show the user. Um, so, Talking about what, when we were introducing Martin into our own shop and trying to sell it to the other developers, the big selling points for us, Martin on top of PostgreSQL is completely 100% ACID compliant. And for all of you who are irritated at the, uh, the uh, animated GIF here, you can please thank uh, Rob Connery for generating that. So, <clears throat> Let me just try to prove that this really exists. And some of you are coming from more classical database engines. You're saying, so what? This is the way it's always been. I don't know why you're excited about it. But if you've used other NoSQL uh, solutions, this is really exciting. So doing the same kind of thing here. Oh, that's not supposed to be there yet. <clears throat> so it's a little bit ugly. But we have this document that we use all the way through the Martin test, test suite that's just a deep document with different members of almost any kind, and we have a way to kind of randomize it. And we're going to do a lot of testing with. So in our test here, I'm going to generate a thousand, thousand of these target, target documents, and some of which just randomly here, they are red, blue, or green targets. Because I'm really original in my test sample data. So randomly here, I'm going to create a thousand target documents. Some of them are green, some of them are not. We're going to store all of them really quick and save all our target documents here. And then we're going to immediately turn around in a completely different session. We're going to Query for the targets. We're going to find how many green ones there are, and we're going to compare them. So, if you worked on a database engine that was not ACID compliant, and 
a maybe a more typical NoSQL solution that used the idea of eventual consistency, your read side model is not guaranteed to be completely up to date compared to the right side model up here. But if we were ACID compliant, this test should pass. And without a lot of ado, let me run this. And we're green, it works. So at this point when, uh, when I was doing some of the early uh, presentations internally in my shop, um, did this demonstration and, and kind of explains, this means that there's gonna be no form of wait for non-stale results in your code. Um, and this is the point where we, we would finally get some cheers and clapping. I think this is a big deal. All right, so now we're acid. Um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit if that's okay. Uh, no, I'll come back to it. Sorry. Um, so into switching on to a different topic. So at work, I've been reviewing a system, an older subsystem that we know has performance issues. Um, that might justify a little bit of a rewrite. And one of the ways that, that I, I personally approach it differently if we were starting over from scratch is it's, it's a case where we probably need a little bit of an object hierarchy. And what I mean, going back to our order, order sample here, So we have the same kind of order, but let's say that we have very different business logic for international orders versus domestic orders. And they probably, even though I don't do that here, they probably have different data structures. There's probably extra information we have with international orders that don't apply to domestic orders and vice versa. Uh, but still, so there are gonna be some times when we want to look at all the orders together, there are going to be times when we need to only consider domestic or international orders. And we want to allow our business domain and the business logic to vary by the different, uh, different subclasses here. So one thing we can do in, in Martin is one other thing. So we can set up a document hierarchy. In this case, we can say for the order document type, we're going to store domestic orders and international orders as just orders. Okay. That's all the configuration we need. There are plenty of other options, of course, but coming down and so let's just save a couple orders. I'm going to create a domestic order. I'm going to create an international order. I'm going to save both of them. Let's just run this real quick. And I'll just show what the database structure looks like. Okay, not, not a lot to that one. When I come down and I want to start reading things, I can load an order. I can just say, I want an order by its ID. It doesn't really matter if it's domestic or international, I'll be able to get the document. I can more specifically go for, I want to look for an international order with this ID. So I can treat it as a subclass. Same thing, when I drop down into the link support, I can query either against the, the super type or any of the subclasses. And Martin's good enough to be able to query and do, do that filtering for me. Okay, maybe a quick question here. Um, is this also how you would implement, for example, reporting? Imagine if you want to get a total revenue for the month uh, for orders made from Texas. Yeah, uh, possibly. Um, possibly, but I think what you should do or we should do, uh, if you look at Martin's backlog on GitHub, 
there's a couple issues we haven't gotten around to uh, about being able just to project pieces of the document to flat relational database structures. Um, I mean, you, you could do it with Martin Extensibility today, but I think for reporting, reporting is definitely not Martin's strong, strong um, point. I think the way I'd like to handle that in the long run is for that kind of roll up that you start to do that by having read side projections to either flat models. So we've talked about, and there's no reason we can't do both a database view that reads it live from the jagged JSON structure and makes it look like a traditional database view, or as documents get captured, we create a, a purely read only table off to the side that's more suitable for traditional reporting tools. Uh, that's that's still to come, though. So you, you would have to do that on your own today. I, just another word about the, the hierarchical storage. Now at the right, I've got an updated look at what the database looks like. It's just one table. It's one table, and we use, there's just a little bit, if there's an extra metadata table that popped up right now, just to help us disambiguate what type of order it is that Martin uses to know how to query on it and how to look. So if you think you compare this again to an object relational mapping approach where you have to start, stop and think a lot about, do I have multiple tables with like a parent table? Do I do, how do I, how do I store the inheritance hierarchy in the most efficient way for my particular case? Uh, Martin lets you just kind of cut through that Gordian knot and not have to care. You just persist it to a table and you don't have to worry or think a lot about those, those details. Uh, Martin, do you get, have anything else before we go on? Uh, yeah, maybe a completely different question, but how many production systems do you know that are out there using Martin today? And uh, what has been their experience with it? Sure. So just speaking for my shop only, we have one very large um, public-facing website application using it. We have uh, another large internal system with some, that also exposes some internal HTTP services uh, that uses a little bit of the event sourcing and then a small application. So we've had it in production for a couple of years now. Um, it's, we had the, the kind of growing pains that you would absolutely expect, um, a lot of which was mostly around just being new to Postgres, but it's, it's held up pretty well for us. Um, for the outside world, um, I don't know the exact figure, but I would guess just from the traffic we come in, coming in and out of our getter room, uh, it's at least several hundred shops that are using it today. Um, do have quite a bit more community than just my company and myself. So uh, there's enough out there. There's enough people using it and pushing it that I, I think I can stand up and say that Martin is a viable solution. Cool, thanks, Jeremy. All right, so everybody's gonna wanna know, I, and I don't have demos for all of this picked up, but I have the, uh, if anybody has specific requests, I can always switch over and show you unit tests for how this is all used. But now the question is, how fast is Martin, and what kind of tricks and levers and, and features can I use to make Martin go faster in my system. So <clears throat> here's just a, a quick list of some of the things that we can do. Uh, one of the huge advantages of uh, PostgreSQL, and, and I understand the SQL Server can support this now as well, um, the idea of calculated indexes. We can actually index completely, we can index the JSON document itself We've been able to prove that Postgres is perfectly capable of picking up the index. 
um, in its own own planet. But let's switch over and look at some of the things that Martin can, can do. So I'm going to go back to that acid solution. Let me scoot this up a little bit. So the first thing I would say, this is not something you have to do on, you have to worry about, Martin just does this for you. When we store, when we store the targets here, when you commit the update, Martin try, spends a lot of energy, it batches these changes up. Um, it is trying, it makes as many document updates as it can in one round trip to the database. Um, Underneath Martin, we use the NPG SQL library as the low-level ADO.NET provider for Postgres. And it has a really great model for batching up SQL requests to the database. So the way you've always been taught, growing up as a developer, network round trips are evil. Um, Martin tries very hard to minimize the number of, of network round trips we make going up. So that's a big deal. Um, we've had a, a, a lot of contributions from, from folks in, uh, to help us out as far as reducing the number of memory allocations inside of Martin's internals. So things like um, serializing straight to a byte array with all the object pooling and data pooling tricks you can possibly do to avoid having all those extra object allocations from from serializing or reading from a string. Uh, we've already done a lot of that work that pops up in Martin 2.0. That's been very beneficial. Um, just talking about inserting here, if we want to make the inserting go faster, if you need to suddenly toss in a bunch of new, new uh, documents, We can switch to this feature, the bulk insert. There is this takes advantage of a um, of a streaming feature inside of Postgres, the binary writer that enables you to much much more efficiently write um, a lot of rows to a single table. So we take advantage of this to have kind of a, a bulk insert feature. So this will run. I don't remember the exact number, but my recollection is, is it's about 50% faster than using the store mechanism here. So that's one thing we can do. On the read side, we've got a couple things we can do. The first thing, we can use a calculated index. So now in my setup, I'm just telling him telling Martin that, hey, I would like a, a default calculated index for the color property of the target document. Let me run this, Let's see if I can, one second. Let me refresh this. So our target object, you'd have to squint super, super close on this, but it's creating a new index, a calculated index, and that jump right there is the Postgres operators to, to be able to get into the JSON blob. But that gives us a calculated index that Postgres can use to make querying on that, that color property much more efficient. Um, another thing we can do, if you have a document where you are doing any number of queries against it, um, say instead of querying mostly on one or two properties, you're doing a lot of ad hoc queries on it. There is a type of index in Postgres. Um, I'm going to have to send you to the Postgres documentation to see more of the details. But it creates, an in, it creates an index map across the entire document. So this, this does quite a bit to speed up um, more ad hoc queries all the way throughout the document structure, with, with the obvious downside being this will slow down your inserts somewhat. How much? You're going to have to test it for yourself, because it's going to depend a lot on the object size. 
So that, that's indexing. Um, so let me get into a feature that I think is unique to Martin. So I, I don't know how much y'all are familiar with, with the guts of how Link actually works. <laughs> what we found from users asking questions or <laughs> complaining about the, the missing parts of Link, I, I, I think people might be under a, a misapprehension about how much magic is really in the link, the, the link mechanics. But what's, what I would say is a .NET developer going into any other environment, link is awesome. I think it's one of the very best things about the .NET ecosystem. Um, Don Sign and all the folks who worked, who, who made this possible, you guys are awesome. We love it. It's also extremely inefficient. What's happening when you're going on here is when you issue a link query, there's a whole bunch of work that's going on. We use a tool, um, you might be familiar with this, seeing it from a framework. We use a tool called Relink as a helper. First, it parses through all of this expression and builds kind of the intermediate model of what the query is. You have these where clauses, this is what the document you're targeting. You have operators like count and select and order by and paging and all these kind of things. From there, Martin has to go through a visitor, go, go parse through all that kind of expression, then finally build up, figure out how to go from that intermediate model to building up a SQL statement and then select how to handle the data coming back and finally turning it into a document. And at this point, trying to explain everything that's going on there, I'm out of breath, but I'm trying to make the point, there's a whole lot of mechanical goop happening in there to go from this nice, clean, strong type link expression to actually doing work. And it turns out it's really expensive. So what we did in Martin that I'm super duper proud of is something we call the compiled query step. So instead of writing a query link straight up, let's say I want to be able to find the number of target documents by color. So I'm going to create a class here called find by color that's going to represent, in this case, you can kind of think of it as a query object. Um, I'm going to send you to the Martin documentation for a, a better explanation of mechanics, but I'm going to implement this little interface that I'm going to query against targets and I'm going to return an integer. And my property here, this is my input here. I'm going to look for a certain color. Now, I kind of express what the link query is one time. Coming down into the usage here, we're basically doing the exact same thing. But when I query, instead of using link, I'm just sending it a find by color object. Let me just prove that this works real quick. And we're green. So what's happening here, the first time in your system you use the find by color, color object, it's parsing the link one time, creating a template for what the SQL should look like, how to map the color property to an ADO.NET parameter behind the scenes, how to, what the proper strategy is for parsing or, or dealing with the results of the reader and how it gets marshaled back into the real data. And all of that is remembered. So now the next time I try to use the find by color in the system, we bypass all the expression parsing, all the link parsing, and we go much faster straight to delivering our results. Um, we, we measured this. This makes a humongous difference in performance when you do this. Plus, it, it also has the advantage. It does act as traditional query objects inside of uh, inside of some DD strategies. Um, it can make your, your code a little bit cleaner if you are reusing the same kind of query in different places. It gives you a way to avoid repeating yourself. Um, and I, I try to discourage mm -hmm. 
our internal developers from doing too much stubbing or mocking of our document sessions inside of uh, inside of unit tests. But I do say that one of the exemptions from that is it's okay to to step out our I document session if you're using one of these compiled queries um, rather than trying to mock out the, the real link layer. Uh, Mark, before I go on to the next thing, any questions about that? So super uh, duper. Yeah, I have a couple. Is there an option to do faceted searches as well? Say that again? Is there the ability to do faceted searches? Um, Martin, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not understanding the, the term. Uh, so in, in RavenDB, for example, you have the option to do uh, to search by a certain facet. So imagine you are building a online store and you want to get all the PCs with 32 gigabytes of RAM, for example. Mm -hmm. um, how easy is it to add something like that in, in one of these queries? Um, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm sorry. I'm not, not following, um, the link support. I mean, I have to send you the documentation for exactly what we support. Um, link support does most of the things you would expect it to do. Um, there is, if need be, you can always drop down. I don't have a sample for this in the talk today. But you can always drop down to raw SQL and still have Martin help you out with resolving the document types. So one way or another, there's not going to be much that you can't do. Um, longer term, we know there's kind of a gap when you get into really, really weird kind of searches. Eventually, we're going to have a feature where we're just going to allow you to write a, a JavaScript function that I can just ascertain true or false so that you can do anything. Um, maybe not the best answer the, the questioner is looking for, but that's, that's what I got. No worries. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll send you the questions afterwards so you can answer to uh, the person who asked for it. Cool. Um, I was just talking about a few of the other things. So if you are coming from Raven, we have a very similar include model. Uh, to allow you to fetch multiple uh, documents at the same time. Um, the serializer today is built in. It's Newson. It's newtonsoft.json. Um, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's the default because it can handle anything. Um, we have users. It is, it is pluggable. We have some users that use Jill. Um, I've kind of removed that from our own testing library. There's there's just a few kinds of document structures where it'll choke. So that's, your experience may vary. Um, really excited, uh, is it UTF-8 string? The, or UTF-8 JSON? It, it, it's a terrible name, <laughs> but somebody has a, a JSON serializer library that's looking much, much faster than Newton Soft that uses Rosalind to um, to generate code on the fly to do the, the serialization. And uh, initial reports are it is usable inside of side of Martin in place of Newtonsoft. So if you're okay walking outside of the JSON serialization mainstream, there are much faster approaches. And um, uh, that will give you a big speed bump and boost over, over Newtonsoft. Just understanding that Maybe it can't handle some, it may put more limitations on what your documents can look like. Uh, since we're running a little late on time, let me skip to the event store, if that's okay. So, and if you're completely new to event sourcing, my recommendation is just to go find Greg Young's original paper where he describes how to build your own event store and a little bit about event sourcing. I think it's the best background. It's 
that paper stayed up on my screen the entire time I was working on Martin Event Store, or the initial part of it. Um, now I'm not going to get too deep into it. Um, to be honest, my shop doesn't use it very heavily. And there's a lot of features in the event store that have come from the community. Um, I think the event store might actually be the most popular part of, of Martin. Uh, that's kind of kind of taken off for us a little bit. Let's let's still get into a little bit. Let me clear things out. I'll clean things up a little bit. So everybody get ready to groan at the uh, the sample here. So, um, like I'm guessing many of you read way too many epic fantasy novels in my lifetime, whether it's Lord of the Rings or or whatnot. So let's say we're building a system that is kind of recording the events that happen to a party in one of these one of these books where they go off on some kind of quest. They start the quest, members let's get this up. Members join up. Quest starts, ends, members leave. You know, maybe we have things like, we track things like we discover talismans, we slay monsters, however it goes. And we're capturing this and storing the events as they happen so that we can go back in time later maybe and say, what was the state of the party at a certain, certain time? Or what is the, and at the same time, We'd like to know, be able to compile from these raw events, what does the party look like now? So inside of our event store, now, um, it's a little funny here. When we started doing this, the, the samples I was using inside of the Martin Test Suite, I was, uh, um, I was using the first book in Lord of the Rings. And at one point or another, I had a pull request coming in to correct some of the events, more or less of these characters were not part of the party at this point in the book. And I, I thought that was pretty funny. And of course he was right. But <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna set up, my doc, set up my document store the same way as always, and just wipe it clean. No, to capture events, Let's say that we have, we're going to start off, we know that we have three events for a particular stream. We have a little more flexibility on how you identify streams. Um, a stream would be a related collection of events. So inside of, um, let's say we were doing some kind of order management event sourcing stream, you might have a stream that represents a single order. So all the events or an invoice. So a stream would represent things like the invoice was created, invoice approved, invoice paid, but they all relate to a single stream. And the only thing stream matters for here is just a way to group related related events. So um, like I said, we have a little more flexibility now on how these streams are identified, um, except your only two options are as either a GUID or a stream. So, Let's say um, any of you happen to have read the Wheel of Time series, we're going to start the quest to escape Eamon's Field. And early on, we got a couple of characters that join the quest. Let's make a little more sense if we, day one, on day one, then on day five, Tom leaves. <clears throat> I'm going to create a session just like I always have because it's still our unit of work. And in this case, I'm going to say I'm going to start a stream for this particular GUID, for the GUID that we assigned up here, and I have these three events. This is a params array. It can just be one event. It can be as many one to many events here. Um, I'm going to save my changes. Later on, I may come back and say, I'm going to pin extra events to that same stream. And here I add a couple other characters. So the events of pin and start stream, um, that, that has been a little bit of problematic. The 
semantics are a little bit different, but honestly, they really do the same thing. Uh, we've talked about getting rid of it, just calling it a pin. But the start screen hat gives you just a tiny, tiny optimization to know that to let Martin treat it as if it's a brand new stream. Um, makes some things I'm going to show this second a little faster. So when we're talking about raw event data, it's the raw event data is something you're probably not going to consume very often in its, its raw form. You may. What you do, so with our CQRS style of architecture, if you're using event sourcing, you probably want to have some kind of read side view that's a projected view of what the current state is of the event stream. So in our case, let's say we very crudely have an aggregate object for our read side model called Quest Party. And in the end, it's just going to tell you who are all the current members, um, uh, some other pieces of information. The real thing would probably be more, just be more to it than this, but all we're doing right now is just aggregating who are the current members. So inside of our event store, these projections in Martin can be one of three different, they can be calculated at one of three different times. In our case, we're going to do a live aggregation. So coming down here, we've already created the stream, we've appended four events, now I want to see I want to see what the current state of the quest party is for this this particular quest right now. So let's do that. <laughs> okay, and if you squint really hard, I have it just doing a JSON serialization of our quest party. And so you can see, we know all the members that are currently part of the quest party, minus Tom who left somewhere along the way. So what's happening here when I call aggregate stream, behind the scenes, it's finding all the events for this, this stream. And one of, not the only, but one of the built-in mechanisms to build up a, uh, an aggregation is this kind of pattern you see here of apply with the events. So it's creating a new quest party and it's running all the events through the proper methods where the aggregate updates itself. Uh, don't worry too much if you don't like that pattern uh, because there are other ways to get this done inside of Martin. It's just what I'm most comfortable with. So in a case where you may have lots and lots of writes of events, but very, very rarely try, need to read the total state of the event stream. You may be more efficient if you do the aggregation live on demand, instead of trying to, to keep the extra quest party document up to date. And that's what we're doing here. At the same token, just to make this a little smarter, there's some extra arguments here. We can uh, we can do things like say, I want to see what the quest party looks like at a certain certain revision number of the event. I can say, I want to see what it looked like at this particular timestamp. <clears throat> there, there's a lot of extra things we can do. So we can do what are historical queries on what this looks like. Um, just to give an example, the first system I ever got to do using event sourcing, even though it never made it into production, was abandoned. Um, it was a system to optimize the flow in a uh, operating room. Um, so part of that, you know, what doc, the doc, were the doctors there? Were all the instruments ready? Was the patient there? What state were they in? Did we have, were we behind on the schedule? Uh, by doing it through event sourcing, we could look at the state of, of the operating rooms at any time during the day, and you could kind of use that to, to see the, the historic replay. It could tell you where things were going wrong, so you could spot. We got behind all day because this one event 
at some point at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, but this this aggregate stream where you can say at this time or this version gives you the ability to do that. So that's the first pattern. Now, if you let's say you get into a case where you have very few writes, but a lot of reads for the quest party. Um, so in that case, I think what you want to do is you want to have the quest party kind of built in advance and stored as its own document type. So what we can do is we can set up an aggregate, aggregated projection that happens in line. So what this means for Martin, you see this looks like the exact same code because it is. When we save changes, we've told Martin to, um, to apply this quest party type of aggregation as part of the unit of work. So when we call save changes here, it is seeing that I have these events that apply to this quest party aggregation. I'm going to update the quest party document for this stream on the fly right now, and that's going to be part of the same transaction. So when I run this, I got that at the bottom, but it doesn't matter. We run this and then we'll look at the database. Okay. Refresh the latest. So what we have now, I'll talk about these a little later. So we've persisted off our events. Let me see if I can pull up the data. Uh, I don't use this tool very often, so I'm not super quick with it. So you can see we saved off four events. You can see how this is stored in the, in the database. That is one table. I guess I could talk more about how that's going to change in the long run, but just kind of ignore that for right now. Now, that quest party that's the aggregation, as part of the, the, the two transactions we just pulled up, we've actually updated that document. And it's just a Martin document in the document DB. So that query party that is now, it's now a persistent document that's the read side aggregate, aggregated view of the, query, the event stream. We can query that with link. We can do anything that we can do with a normal Martin document against that read side model. But I think this is a, a this is the reason why we think it was justified to add the event sourcing into Martin. It gives us very tight integration and an easy way with the read side model. Lastly, with the event store, um, it's not always going to be feasible to want to calculate the aggregations in line, say that this quest party, or say that you want to aggregate across multiple streams or do any kind of aggregation where you're concerned that there may be a lot of concurrency. Um, so we have one final approach. You can, you can introduce eventual consistency back in for your projections. Um, we have a feature we call the asynchronous daemon that you would host in your own application. There'd be a remnant process that off to the side reads through the events as they come in and runs them through all of the registered projections and continuously updates and rebuilds the read side models in background threads. So this gets you back to the eventual consistency model that you're probably more used to with other NoSQL tools and probably gives you the same kind of usage you would have with, with other event stores like Get Event Store. So this showing this just to prove that it works. Kick it off again. I'm not sure that I ran. Okay. So 
they did the same same kind of thing, um, with the difference being that I lied. Sorry. Try one last time. Hey, cool, and we still worked. So the async daemon, you would normally just leave it running to update uh, update events as they come along. Um, it was one of the ugliest, nastiest things I've ever built in my life. It has a lot of functionality to um, kind of accommodate things like gaps in the event stream sequencing, um, trying to make sure you don't get out too far ahead of the database while also keeping up with the database and trying to ensure that you see all the events in the correct order. Um, it was ugly, but it gives the ability to have that background, constant background building of asynchronous events. And also, I'm not getting into it, but it's your mechanism to end development time if you want to say, I am changing up and continuously redeveloping a projection. You can use this to completely blow away a, a particular projected document and rebuild it up with a new definition at development time and, and in deployment time as well. So I'm a little bit over time. Um, did have more content, but I think I'm gonna stop for just for questions if that's okay, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of questions. Uh, one was, if bulk inserts are faster than regular inserts, can, can't can we use bulk inserts for single inserts as well? Uh, you could, but I don't think that, I don't know that that would even be faster. Um, right. You would have to, you would have to test, honestly, you, you'd have to test that yourself to see if it's even worth it. Right. Um, when you started the event store section, uh, you mentioned a paper. Um, what was the name of the paper again? Um, sorry, I hadn't thought to talk about that before. Uh, if you see it on the screen, it, it's this one. Uh, if you can just, if you can just Google for event sourcing paper by Greg Young, I think you can get to it. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, then one more, is there an ability to do map reduce kind of queries like in RavenDB? So for example, uh, give me all products in a certain category and count the number of products per category. So that, that kind of query, yes, that's not, it doesn't really, that can be done straight up with the link support. That doesn't really require map reduce. We don't have direct map reduce capability. Um, it's not something we needed yet, but that particular query could be done through, just through the link, just with a where clause and then, then a, maybe a select many and a count. Um, so my thoughts on that for the long term, um, it's not even try to do map reduce. I mean, we kicked that idea around at the beginning. Um, th that's a place where I think we would go through an intermediate step of projecting it to relational structures where straight up SQL is gonna, gonna tear through that faster than anything. Uh, but that's just my opinion. All right, cool. Um, there's one more, but I think it may eventually end up on your blog as a very elaborate um, blog post topic. Um, it's about multi-tenancy and how you would uh, tackle multi-tenancy using Martin. Uh, how do we tackle multi-tenancy using Martin? Uh, one second. Um, I had meant to demonstrate that and didn't quite get to it. One second, and I will pull that up.
So uh, right now, the yeah, uh, so here, here's your setup. So the only multi-tenancy strategy that we support today um, is what we call conjoined. But so we support. Um, on a document by document basis, or I can say, you can see in the code here, I just say, I want all documents to be tenanted. Um, it adds a, a tenant ID to the tables. So we do tenant everything in the same table and use the strategy of having a tenant ID column. And the link support automatically, when you, here, when you open the session here, now you have a different flavor of open session where you supply the tenant ID. And that behind the scenes tags on where clauses to all SQL, all SQL, or all link executions or load, even load executions so that your reads only show you data from the current tenant. And when you're persisting, it's, it's tagging it as a current tenant ID. Um, we kicked around early on, we kicked around the other approaches. Some of the other approaches for doing this are schema per tenant. Um, we haven't done yet. That was actually going to be the hardest thing to do with Martin for historical reasons. Um, the problem with that is it would require Martin to have either you were going to have to know all the tenants up front or you were going to have to give Martin um, your Postgres, whatever your Postgres user you're running under would have to have DDL rights on the production database. And most DBAs are probably not going to let you do with that. Um, we've also talked about doing a database per tenant, but you have the same kind of limitation there. Either you have to have the rights to create a database on the fly or you have to know all the tenants up front. So right now, the only strategy we support is the everything in the same table with the tenant ID. But uh, we're using multi-tenancy today in a pretty large internal system, and it's going fine. So we, we have something there. All right, then maybe one more to answer while we switch back to my screen here. Uh, how did you convince your company to build something from the ground up instead of using an existing document database? Well, um, don't know if you missed the, uh, the beginning of the talk. We were using an existing document database, and it was going very badly. Um, so I don't know that we necessarily told management exactly what we were doing, um, but in this case... This case was a little bit of a special sell. We were sitting on top of, we were going to sit on top of PostgreSQL itself, just an existing, existing tool, well proven, lots of documentation, plenty of consulting resources that we did engage with. We, we had some help from Second Quadrant as we were standing things up. So we didn't really build a, a brand new document database ourselves. We built a client access library that just to make Postgres act the way we wanted it to. So I, I'd say that's way less stress than trying to build something from scratch. And again, we started from an existing tool that was that was causing us a lot of support problems in production. So maybe you just say that we were in a little bit of a desperate state, but it's worked out for us. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Um, there's a couple more questions, but we'll see if we can get them to you after the webinar and uh, to, to answer them offline if possible. Um, thank you for hosting this webinar and thank you for giving this presentation. Um, I was very attentive because every time you mentioned Martin, I was actually watching the screen, so thank you for that. Uh, 
If you want to learn more about Martin, um, the GitHub page is on the slide that you see here. So feel free to go there. Follow Jeremy on Twitter. Give us feedback. Give Jeremy feedback. And we'll post a recording somewhere in the next week um, on our JetBrains channels. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.